you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to Mark chapter 5. Um, you've heard Brett the last two weeks, and Brett's, Brett's a preaching machine, man. I mean, he is, he is good. He intimidates me uh, to have up here. He's, a, he's a incredible. Um, but we are in a, in a situation that in two weeks, three weeks, we're going to be getting our Christmas uh, uh, messages, which is really crazy that time has moved like this. But we kind of have some these one-off weeks, and this allows me the, the opportunity just to kind of um, relate to you what I sense the Lord is, is pounding on my heart right now. And uh, Mark chapter 5 is, is one of those things. But... We're going to talk today about desperation. I don't know if you've ever been in a desperate situation. I don't know what that may have been, uh, but you do desperation leads you to a place where you'll do almost anything to get out of that desperation. Many people I, I read have done different things. Some have sold like their wedding rings. Some have been willing to sell. Uh, organs, to kidneys or something to make money to make ends meet. You get desperate and you want things to happen. Um, I, I read, and you remember this story, many of you, April 26, 2003. It was just uh, a hiking time for a guy by the name of Aaron Ralston. He had gone out into the mountains in Colorado. He made a mistake by going by himself. And he went out, and he was bouldering. He was doing different climbing. And he, uh, the, a boulder uh, broke loose and pinned his arm to the ground. Now, Aaron Ralston was by himself, and he shouldn't have been, but he needed to do something or he was going to die on the mountain. So he did, in this desperate situation, he did the unthinkable. He pulled out his knife and began to cut his arm off. And that's what he did. He cut his arm off. Now, he survived, but he lost his arm. He's a motivational speaker right now, probably making uh, millions for, for speaking in that story. But this 27-year-old man was willing to do the unthinkable because of a desperate situation that he was in. I think we live in desperate days as a church. And I think our country and our world is in desperate days. And so how do we respond to these desperate times? Is there a desperation in us that hungers for God? Well, we're going to read in Mark chapter 5 an account of desperation and how God came through in that desperation. And then this is where I want you to get eventually. How desperate are you for a move of God? In Mark chapter 5, we're beginning to verse 21. I want to read the scene 1, what I call scene 1. And this is how it goes. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. This is the Sea of Galilee. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet, he fell at Jesus' feet, and he implored him, begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and, a, and a live. And he went with him, and a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. Let's stop there. Scene one. Scene one is uh, incredible. This crowd is following Jesus. They're pressing in on him. And you know the way crowds are. We, we saw in Houston last week this crowd becoming so massive and pushing that nine people lost their lives in Houston. And, and, and the verbiage here is a crowd that's just pressing upon Jesus. I mean, they're, they're so, you know, you know, no personal space. They're just crowding. And here's my thought. If you want a crowd 
Just let the things of Jesus happen and a crowd shows up. We're, we're tempted so often as a church, we want to do the things that are going to please somebody out there so that the crowd may come that we please them enough or entertain them enough. I want you to know, church, that the things of Jesus start happening, the crowd shows up. And that's what happened here. The crowd is going, uh, squashing in on Jesus. And Jairus, Jairus was a synagogue ruler. That meant he was a man of influence. He was a man that had to be popular with the people. But he was a man of authority as well. And somehow they parted enough for him to, so that he fell on his feet, uh, fell uh, on his face right at the feet of Jesus. And I've come to the conclusion, the highest place to stand is at the feet of Jesus. And that's where he was. He fell at the feet of Jesus and he starts giving him the story that his daughter, we're going to find out in a minute, she's 12 years of age, and a, and a young, young lady became a lady at the age of 12, and this is where she is. And she has a disease, we don't know what the disease is, but it's at the point of death. And so at the feet of Jesus, he begins to recount about how much he needs Jesus right now. And he needs him so bad that he's imploring him, he's begging him to do anything he can to come and help him. And, and knowing this is, this is where the radical desperation takes place. There's a good chance the religious leaders, he's going to catch their wrath because they don't like Jesus anyway. Also, he can lose his job because of that. He's so desperate, he's willing to come almost to the other side to see Jesus to get him to heal his daughter. And it would not be popular. It would not be popular with the religious leaders. So this is a risk that he is there. But isn't it interesting that desperation will lead you to do strange things? And his humility um, is part of that approaching Christ. I want you to know that desperation reaches the heart of God. It reaches the heart of God. Usually the thing that kills us in our walk with Christ is our affluence. We would think our affluence would lead us to be grateful, would lead us to, God, I want to follow you no matter what. But our affluence so often leads us to self-sufficiency, and at that point we don't seek God. But desperation reaches the heart of God. And he was pleading, he was asking God, and his belief was, was Jesus, oh, you alone can do this. You alone can do this. And so he's begging Jesus to come. And Jesus, despite the crowd, despite what anything that's going on that's pressing in around him, he says, I'm going to go with you. I, I, lo I love this about Jesus in the New Testament. Jesus works more in the distractions than in the plans. And Jesus had a plan. He was going, eventually he was going to end up at the cross and the empty tomb. He was going to resurrect. But yet day by day, he saw the Father in the distractions and he was willing to leave the crowd to go meet with the one. I love that because some of you are here today and you're thinking, man, there's no way that Jesus would even think something of me. The things I've done in my past, uh, just my life, I'm unworthy. Uh, there's no way. I want you to know he's willing to leave the crowd for you. He's willing to leave the crowd for you today. He, I think he's waiting sometimes just for our hunger to turn to him. Scene one. Now we got scene two, beginning in verse 25. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, and the, and the verbiage here is over and over, she's repeating this, for she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up, 
And she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, and look what she does, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Notice she found herself at the same place that Jairus was at the feet of Jesus. And if you go back to the beginning of Mark chapter 5, there was a demon, demonized man who was in the gathering tombs that, that he ran wild there. And when Jesus showed up, he was at the feet of Jesus. Let me tell you, there's something about being at the feet of Jesus where things happen. And Lord, humble us to be those kind of people. But here's this woman. Because of, of the blood disease, the blood situation that she has, she was considered unclean. She could not uh, participate in, in worship. She was considered unclean. She was an outcast. She was lonely. She was hopeless. She probably was broke. She was embarrassed, and she was unworthy. That's the way she was. It, it described, in describing her, some of you may feel the same way. 300 people in this room, and you're, you're feeling alone. You're feeling hopeless. You're feeling, does God even care? Does anybody really care what's going on in my life? I want you to know you can't run from God. He sees it, and He loves you in the midst of where, where you're walking right now. He wants to care for you. And she heard about Jesus. And just the hearing. that See, that's our responsibility. Is to put Jesus out there so that people will hear about him. And she comes in desperation. And she touches and is healed. I want you to see a picture. This is uh, when we, we've been to Israel a few times. And in Magdala, which uh, is Mary Magdalene, is, is from Magdala. And there's a Catholic church in Magdala. And, and this painting is huge there. Some of you have been. I mean, it is huge. Uh, and this is just a, a picture, a print of that. And notice, you, you look at this picture. It was about a Spanish artist. And the picture is really kind of weird because it's just the feet. Obviously, you're thinking in a church, this is the feet of Jesus. There's tons of feet around there, but notice the hand. Notice the hand reaching through these feet in this crowded scenario and just touching the hem of Jesus' garment. This is called the encounter, and it's an incredible painting. It, it moved all of us when we saw it because you see that one hand that, that she's doing the only thing she can to get to the hem of the garment is to reach among these feet and she's healed. And, and that picture says so much about the power of Christ and what he's willing to do. Nothing is hidden from her. And that one touch freed her from her suffering and her plague and her scourge that she was under. And notice, Jesus noticed. Uh, you know, it, it's just kind of weird. When you're in a crowd, uh, you know, you... you if you've ever traveled somewhere where they have subways and everybody's crammed in a subway and there's no personal space, you know, you feel a lot of stuff, but man, you just don't feel what Christ felt because he felt the power go out from him in the midst of all these people cramming in upon him. And he felt that and he turns and who touched me? And the disciples, the disciples were just like us. They, they don't have a clue sometimes. They, they just said, uh, man, all these people, who touched you? That's a ridiculous question. But he turns and this woman is face down at his feet and he says, daughter, arise, you've been made whole. Now here's the interesting thing. The word be made whole there is not just her physical, but it was her mental, her emotional, her spiritual. She was holistically 
made well. You see, sometimes a physical healing is really not what somebody needs. What they need is their emotions. They need their mind. They need their soul and their spirit to be made whole. And that's what Jesus did in touching uh, in this woman's touch of him. And he said, you know, you are made whole. She was made completely whole. No more embarrassment. She confessed and, and no more embarrassment. Now we got scene three. Scene three takes us back to the continuation of scene one. Verse 35. While Jesus was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. He's seeing the despair. He, he's seeing the desperation in these people. A commotion is happening. They're weeping. They're wailing loudly because they think the little girl is dead. Verse 39, and when he had entered, he said to them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. In other words, what, uh, what appears to be this way is not true. You know, so often we look at a situation. Now, death is, is a situation. But we look at a situation and we think this is a hopeless situation. We look at our country and we think, man, this is a hopeless situation. This is, we're desperate in our nation. We look at our community and certain things. We look at uh, maybe education, whatever you want to look at it. We despair and we think there is, the, what can happen? The, the, we need to bury it. And Jesus comes along and says, oh, things aren't as you see. Things aren't as you see them. And then verse 40. And they laughed at him. They mocked him. They jeered him. They, they laughed at him. I would hate to be known in, throughout history as the person who laughed at Jesus. But he put them all outside, and he took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. And taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kume which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age, and they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Jesus shows up, and he changes everything. He And you know, just... I say this all the time, but I want to remind you. Jesus did not come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people come alive. And so what he has done here is he's bringing life out of death. And he shows up, and they, they laugh at him. But that doesn't offend him. You know, I, I'm just thinking, Jesus, send an angel to strike a man. Send lightning. I mean, just take these guys out. But how much does my life just mock Jesus? I mean, do I want him to do that to me every time I... No. And so what he does is he, he just lovingly somehow sends them away and he comes and he takes this little girl's hand. And what's interesting is, isn't Jesus remarkable in that he doesn't heal everybody the same way? There was a time he stuck fingers in a guy's ear. There was times that he just spoke. There was times that he just touched lepers, unclean people. There was a time he made mud packs and put them on the eyes. I think the reason he did that is because we, we in our Western world, we're terrible about, we would start a church ar around the mud packs. We would start a church around the fingers and the ear. We would start a, you know, speak, just speak the word kind of thing. That's the way we're wired. But he takes gently this little girl's hand and he speaks to her in Aramaic, their, their native language, Talitha Kum, little child arise. 
and there she was, and he says, feed her. And it's just amazing how he showed up in this desperate time that he was there for them. He drew close to the little girl. He touched her, and he gently spoke to her and he raised her up. Man, in desperation, a desperate plea of a father reached the heart of God, and he, and he changed things. So what? What does that mean to you and me? Four, four quick thoughts, and they're going to be bulleted, so you can write them down. Number one is this. Jesus draws near to the desperate. Psalm 42 says, As the deer pants for the water's brook, so my soul yearns for you, O God. We see Jesus even said in the Beatitudes, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they're the ones that will be satisfied. We've lost our desperation today. We, we don't truly hunger for the presence of God. We, we want Him to make us comfortable. We don't want to really see His presence move in our day. I, that's what I feel so often. And Jesus draws near to the desperate. As long as we think we can do it, it won't get done. I mean, the Lord is just waiting for us to trust Him. And He draws near to the, those that are desperate. Second thought is this. Jesus totally restores. He doesn't just, just give you a little bit. I mean... How many of us in this room came to Christ because we didn't want to go to hell? And so we want to go to heaven, so I'm going to come to Christ. And, and we think, we start living our lives as though that's the only thing. And He's given us His Holy Spirit as a guarantee, and He wants to bring you full health and restoration today as you walk with Him. He wants to empower you to use you while you're here on this earth. And so he brings complete restoration. Third thing is this. Jesus wants, to, wants us to know the power of confession. He had compassion on this lady who had the issue of blood. And she's there on her face before him at his feet, the best place to be. And she starts confessing. I'm the one that touched you. You know, Jesus knew that. He said, who touched me? And he just had to turn around and he saw her. But yet, how many times do we think we can hide things from the Lord? I can hide that. He won't know that. Really? Is that how small our God is? He knows it. He knows the motives. He knows everything in that. But he's a God who restores and there's power in confession. And maybe today you're confessing your need for him today. And then the fourth thing is this. Jesus longs to show intimacy and compassion upon his creation. He longs to show. I mean, we sometimes think that God is like we are. And that and I say that in a ridiculing way towards myself. We think he's stingy like us. We think he is conditional like us. We think all these things. But God is beyond that. He longs to pour his mercy and his compassion and his grace upon his people. So if you're here today and you're thinking, I'm not worthy. None of us are worthy. He doesn't do it because you're worthy. He does it because He loves you. And He wants to pour Himself out on you. But as I wrap this up, here's where I'm wrestling. I think we live in desperate times as a nation. If we look back over the past two years, we've, uh, we've, we've been in these desperate times whether it's the COVID or whether it's racial issues or whether it's a uh, political uh, system, whether it's the uh, school system, whatever. And we see these things and, 
and, and we live in desperate times. And Vance Havner, an old pastor, said this. He said, the tragedy of our time is that the situation is desperate, but the saints are not. And, and, and so we live in desperate times. And I think we're looking to the government to, to solve it. We're looking to people to solve it. We're looking for other things to solve it instead of getting desperate for a move of God. And we need a move of God in our day. We need to see Him. And we, he, the, our community needs to see people that are in love with Him. The Scriptures tell us that judgment begins with the household of God. We cannot expect the government, we cannot expect anybody else but other than the church to begin with the church to begin desperate for a move of God. And that's where my heart is today. And, and it begins, yes, it begins with the church, but each of us as individuals make up the church. And we become desperate. God, we need you. We need you. I've dealt with people, Pam and I have dealt with people before, and we're just wondering, how low can you go? How low can you go? You know what I'm saying? I mean, they just shoot themselves in the foot, and they do it again. And we're thinking, man, if you just turn. But you're thinking, how low can you go? And I think the Lord may be saying, how low can you go? We want to go low enough to be at the feet of Jesus. 